When it comes to the poetry unit, I get the strongest reactions from students than compared to any other unit that I do. Analyzing poetry is just figuring out what's going on in the poem, what the author, what the poet wanted us to get out of it. And some of them are easier than others, absolutely. There have been some poets that I've read that I still have difficulty figuring out. But it's like a puzzle. I like trying to make sense of it. In this video, what I'm going to be showing you are ways that you can try and break down a poem in order to understand it. Analyzing a poem is about figuring it out. It's usually, at least in schools, often directed towards figuring out the theme. Remember, theme is what we call the message of a writing piece when it is fiction or when it's poetry. So we're going to be using these two graphic organizers as the sort of basic analysis uh, first step. So if you're really struggling, these break it down exactly what to look for as you are figuring out a poem, and that can help you with your theme paragraph. The four quadrant analysis, as you see, uh, is split up into, <laughs> surprise, surprise, four quadrants. Uh, in the first one, you're looking at images. The second box is for other senses. Your emotions, explicit and implicit, go in the third box. Um, explicit are emotions that are actually stated or named there in the poem. And implicit are emotions that we are meant to feel. It's like the mood of the poem. And then the fourth box is for key phrases. So you would write down the quote from the poem and the line number, and then explain why is this important. You're looking for significant quotes, significant phrases, significant lines in the poem. The three-part analysis, it focuses a little bit more on the structure of the poem. So, you know, you've got the title author style, but you've also got, does it have a rhyme scheme? Do the ends of the lines rhyme in any sort of pattern? And does it have a rhythm? Is there a beat to it? Do lines have certain numbers of syllables. When we think about, for example, a Shakespearean sonnet, the rhyme scheme is very structured and the rhythm is very structured. It's all of the lines are 10 syllables with a unstressed and stressed pattern to them. The second of the three parts looks at literary devices. So you're looking at things like similes and metaphors, personification, alliteration, assonance, consonance, all of those strategies that poets can use to draw attention to key ideas and key images and key parts of their poem. And then the third part in the three-part analysis is taking all of this and figuring out what the message of the poem is. It's really important to note that the topic of the poem is not the theme. The message of the poem isn't what the poem's about. The message of the poem is what we are supposed to learn from it, what we're supposed to get out of it. The topic of the poem is what the poem's about. So these are the two graphic organizers we're going to use for the basic analysis. The poem we're going to be working with is called You Are Not Responsible by Harriet Mullen. We are not responsible for your lost or stolen relatives. We cannot guarantee your safety if you disobey our instructions. We do not endorse the causes or claims of people begging for handouts. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. Your ticket does not guarantee that we will honor your reservations. In order to facilitate our procedures, please limit your carrying on. Before taking off, please extinguish all smoldering resentments. If you cannot understand English, you will be moved out of the way. In the event of a loss, you'd better look out for yourself. Your insurance was cancelled because we can no longer handle your frightful claims. Our handlers lost your luggage, and we are unable to find the key to your legal case. You were detained for interrogation because you fit the profile. You are not presumed to be innocent if the police have reason to suspect you are carrying a concealed wallet. It's not our fault you were born wearing a gang color. It is not our obligation to inform you of your rights. 
Step aside, please, while our officer inspects your bad attitude. You have no rights we are bound to respect. Please remain calm, or we can't be held responsible for what happens to you. So we will start with uh, images in the four quadrant analysis. So as we're reading through, we're looking for, well, images, pictures that, that come up in our mind. Uh, you can actually do this one drawing if you're doing it by hand. Because I'm doing it on here, I'm going to type. Um, also, I work better personally with words than with pictures. When I look at the poem, I've got the lost and stolen relatives and then people begging for handouts. In the next section, they're talking about like your ticket, reservations, limit your carrying on, which sounds a little bit like carry on, like baggage, taking off, extinguish, smoldering resentments, but in you know the olden days uh, when people were allowed to smoke on airplanes, they had to extinguish their cigarettes. So it's not exactly a perfect parallel, but one of the images from that stanza in particular is this idea of like uh, leaving on a plane trip. Then when I go to the next stanza, we've got more plane trip stuff. The, our handlers lost your luggage, the insurance, the claims, things like that. So I've got, in terms of visuals, um, I've got like the luggage and the key to, in this case it's a legal case, but the implication is sort of like a suitcase. And then, and that first line, if you cannot understand English, you will be moved out of the way. So there's like this image of someone who is not English speaking or English understanding being pushed away, pushed out. Looking at the next stanza, you've got uh, interrogation and profile, um, the police there, uh, concealed wallet, um, wearing a gang color. So in terms of images, there's this picture of someone being um, interrogated, uh, someone being questioned by the police, usually fairly, let's say strongly. And then the last, the last part there, step aside, officer inspects your bad attitude, uh, remain calm or we can't be held responsible. So that kind of links into the someone being questioned by the police. So there we have the images, the pictures that I see in there. The second quadrant is for other senses. You'll usually find with the other senses that there's less in the poems. A lot of poetry is about imagery, which is obviously the pictures. So when we're looking at other senses, sometimes you may not find anything. Uh, sometimes you'll find things that are suggested more than stated outright. In this one, there's a lot of not words that are actually said, but the suggestion of speaking when they say disobey our instructions, then they're giving instructions, um, people begging for handouts, uh, refusing service, um, things like that. So we've got, um, this is implicit, so it's suggested. And then in terms of smell, again, it's more implicit, more suggested, but the extinguish, smoldering, um, the resentments doesn't really work with that one, but it'd be like a fire or, or a cigarette, something that is burning. In terms of touch, you've got the luggage and the key, you've got the concealed wallet. In terms of taste, there's not really anything. There's nothing either suggested or explicitly stated. So then we move on to emotions. And with emotions, let's look at the explicit ones first. And explicit just means ones that are named or described in the poem. Whereas implicit would be ones that you as the reader are supposed to feel. So explicit emotions, you've got the carrying on, the idea of kind of freaking out and 
complaining and, and things like that. You've got the smoldering resentments. Going on to the third stanza, you've got loss. And in the context of the metaphor of a plane ride that this poem's talking about, a loss would usually mean losing your luggage or something like that. But they don't say that here. A loss could be something emotional as well, which is why I'm putting it here in explicit. And then frightful claims, innocence and bad attitude. And then in a sense, responsibility. It's kind of what the whole poem's about. When we look at implicit emotions, we're looking at what are you supposed to feel in this? And when you read through this, the things that they're saying, we're not responsible, uh, we can't guarantee, we don't endorse, there's a lot of negativity there. And then when you look at the other side of that, well, what are they being negative about? What are they saying no to? It's things that you would expect them to be okay with, that it's not really reasonable for them to be saying no to. So we have things like the, we are not responsible for your lost and stolen relatives. We can't handle your frightful claims. You were detained for interrogation because you fit the profile. As readers, implicitly both the person they're addressing the you would be feeling likely pretty upset, pretty frustrated, and not treated very nicely. So there's this sense of guilt on the part of the narrator. We're frustrated with them. They're saying that they're not responsible for things that maybe they should be responsible for. And on the side of the you, there's a lot of resentment and feeling that they're being picked on in a sense, that they're being bullied. In this final section, we're looking at key phrases. So we're looking for quotes and phrases and things that we think are important, that kind of stand out to us. For this one, unlike with the other ones where you're just writing notes, you want to make sure to actually put down the full quote in quotation marks and then the line number and then explain briefly why it's important. So for example, the lost and stolen relatives really stands out to me. And it stands out to me because when I hear lost and stolen relatives, it makes me think of the First Peoples, the First Nations in Canada particularly, whose families were broken up during residential schools, the missing and murdered women in BC, and things like that. As I go through this, when I'm keeping that in mind, there's also things like people begging for handouts. There is the, if you cannot understand English, you'll be moved out of the way. We can't handle your frightful claims. All of that sort of reminds me as well of refugees. So in the context of what's going on now, when I look at this, that's one of the things that it reminds me of. So I'm going to put in a couple of quotes here. And what's coming to me with the First Nations and with refugees is in that fourth stanza. They talk about profiling. They talk about being born wearing a gang color, so the color of your skin. And those kind of link in with what I'm seeing with the, the two phrases that I've got before. I'm doing the square brackets and then the ellipses here because I'm going to take part of this out. And then down at the very bottom and up at the top and in the title, you've got that we are not responsible. This sort of disclaiming of responsibility. You know, things happen, it's not our fault. As we are doing the three-part analysis, we want to look at the structure of the poem in a little bit more detail. So when it says genre, it just means the form of poetry. And this is a free verse poem because it doesn't have a particular rhyme scheme. If we look at the end of the lines, relatives, instructions, handouts, anyone, the lines aren't rhyming. So there's no rhyme scheme. And then there's no rhythm. If we look at the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables and the number of syllables in the line, stanzas are like paragraphs in prose, in poetry. Each of these blank lines here, that indicates a separate stanza. So we've got five. 
Part two in our three-part analysis looks at literary devices. And there's a list of literary devices in the content library in the literary analysis section of your OneNote notebook. But most of the common ones, you'll look for things like alliteration, where you've got the same syllable or the same sound beginning the words. You'll look for metaphors and similes, which are comparisons. You'll look for maybe personification, where something that isn't human appears human. You'll look for allusions, which are references to other texts, to history, to things like that. When we're looking through this, we want to start with what stands out to us. If you look at the third stanza, you can see our handlers lost your luggage. That's an example of alliteration. And because I put the underline there, we can see that it's alliteration, so I don't really need to explain it. Things like similes or metaphors or personification allusions, those you would want to explain because you want to explain how it is that literary device. Some of the things that we talked about with the four quadrant analysis, we can look at from a stronger literary lens here. So, for example, we've got the lost and stolen relatives and the references to reservations. Your ticket does not guarantee that we will honor your reservations. When you look further on, if you cannot understand English, you will be moved out of the way. And then the frightful claims. All of these are allusions to the First Peoples and specifically colonization, or at least all of these can be interpreted as allusions to that. Moving on, we also talked about the refugee crisis being detained for interrogation, being moved out of the way, the claims of people begging for handouts suggest the refugee crisis. As I mentioned when we were talking about the four quadrants just now, there is a metaphor throughout this of a plane journey when you've got the safety instructions at the beginning of the plane ride the right to refuse service, the reservations, the carry-ons, all of those things create this sort of extended metaphor of a plane ride which I interpret the author as using to convey how people of color and First Peoples and refugees are treated by Western countries. Finally, in this particular poem, the other thing that stands out to me is imagery. And imagery you will find in almost any poem because poetry is about conveying images, it's about creating pictures in the minds of the readers. So imagery is a big thing. And imagery is something we've actually already written about when we looked at the images from the four quadrants. So we can use some of those same things for what we're talking about here. All of these are examples of imagery, and they're not all of the ones that we came up with in the four quadrants, but these are some of the key images that stand out for me with this poem. The final step then is to figure out the theme of the poem. And there's a difference between theme and topic. The topic is what the poem's about. The theme is what the message of the poem is. So when we're looking at a theme statement, you can write it as one sentence, but because students have so much difficulty figuring out the difference between topic and message, I have in italics there a structure of a two-sentence theme statement that will hopefully help you target what the theme actually is. So the theme of title of the poem by author of the poem has to doing with topic. Specifically, the author is saying that, and then you would write what the message about the topic, what the author is saying about the topic after that. And using those two sentences together, you come up with a strong theme statement that you can prove with reference to all of the things that we've done so far. The images and other senses and emotions and key phrases from the four quadrants, the literary devices that we've established here. When we're figuring out the theme of a poem, we want to be looking at the whole poem. So our theme statement 
should explain all parts of the poem and it shouldn't be contradicted by anything in the poem. Nothing in the poem should say, well, actually, I don't think that's true. When we go through this, based on the work that we've done so far in analyzing it, the topic of the poem seems to be the Western world, how they treat people of color. And, and it doesn't say specifically America, although America is one of the major Western countries that has had issues around race, particularly in recent years. So we can start with that. So now that we've got the topic down, what's the message? What is Mullen saying about this topic? And as you're reading through, if you read it on the literal level, so the words that are actually being said, you would think that Mullen is saying that the Western world doesn't have any responsibility to people of color, but she's using such irony here. The emphasis on the metaphor of a plane ride and then all of these things that would be completely unreasonable in terms of that, that use of irony suggests that she's actually saying the opposite. She's saying that the Western world, and specifically Caucasian people in the Western world, have a responsibility for how they treat First Peoples, how they treat refugees, how they treat people of color, and that we need to make a change in our structures, in our government, in how we deal with uh, systemic racism. The first time you use an author's name, you use the full name first and last. Every time after that, you just use the last name. So using these two graphic organizers, the four quadrant analysis and the three part analysis, is a fairly straightforward way of figuring out what's going on in a poem and coming up with a theme statement that a little bit later on we're going to be turning into a theme paragraph.